Okay, folks, so right back at it. So I felt that last video getting a little long. I've been trying to record shorter videos for my other class. Uh, my PCAM students told me they like shorter videos. So, um, so I cut that last one off kind of abruptly because I felt it was going a little long. So let's just pick right back up, okay? Um, so more heat capacity calculations, okay? So let's do another sample problem. Um, so a 30 milliliter sample of water at 280 Kelvin is mixed with a 50 milliliter sample of water at 330 Kelvin. Calculate the final temperature of the mixture, assuming no heat loss to the surroundings. So this is exactly what I told you we were going to do, like at the very first lecture I recorded. You have a cold object, hot object. What happens when we mix them? Can we predict the final temperature? And we can, okay? And here's how we're going to do it, okay? First of all, we're going to recognize, so one thing I'm going to tell you, a couple tips here. So again, when I have a hot object in contact or mixing with a cold object, heat will flow from the hot object to the cold object, okay? So what that means is if we look at the heat, the Q of the hot object, so the heat delivered to the hot object has to be the heat absorbed by the cold object, right? Because if we're assuming there's no heat loss to the surroundings, that's kind of like saying this whole thing is a, like in an isolated container, okay? So the heat from the hot object has to be the heat delivered to the cold object. And specifically, we have to say negative Q hot equals positive Q cold. This is going to be really important for this calculation to get it right. So if heat is leaving the hot object, right, then as viewed by the hot object, that's negative. And if heat is entering the cold object, then as viewed by the cold object, that's positive. So this is something that's good to kind of commit to memory. When you have objects in contact, negative Q hot equals positive Q cold, okay? And so from there we can, um, and then the other thing I'll tell you, right, because it's 30 mils of water, um, I should have given you this in the problem, but we'll assume that water is one gram per milliliter, right? So that should have said that in the problem, but it didn't. So if we have negative Q hot equals positive Q cold, um, and I've got mass here in the form of density from my volume, then what I'm going to do is say now this, I know that Q equals M times CS times delta T. And there's a negative, so that's for the hot object. And now for the cold object, that's going to be an M times a CS, also times a delta T. Okay, And of course, there's a positive sign in front of there. And so now, if I start plugging away here and recognizing if I'm assuming one gram per milliliter, then I'm just going to replace this with this 30 milliliters is going to become 30.0 grams, and this 50 milliliters is going to become 50.0 grams, okay? So let's see here. The 50 grams was the hot stuff, so we're going to plug and chug away. I'm going to say 50.0 grams. The um, heat capacity of water, so I looked up a better value. I also didn't give that to you there. So CS of water, I know we calculated it before, but it's actually 4.184 joule per gram per degree C. Is the experimental value. So I, I, there's two things I forgot to give you in this problem. So if you're freaking out, like, how do I do this problem? So keep in mind, you would have had to have the heat capacity and the density, which you could have looked up as well, okay? And so now what am I solving for? Calculate the final temperature. So in this delta T, that's going to be TF minus, but now I have to get the initial temperature right. And so for the 50 grams of water, that initial temperature was 330 Kelvin. And now because that's Kelvin, I'm going to recognize that I can write this unit as joule per gram per
per Kelvin as the same thing as joule per gram per degree C. Okay, and so now all of that equals um, positive. So I put a parenthesis there and a parenthesis there. Okay, and then so that's 30 grams, and it's still 4.184 joule per gram per Kelvin. And then now it's still TF. And we recognize that this TF and this TF are going to be the same. That's the quantity that I'm solving for. And so because it's delta T, it's temperature final minus temperature initial, and the cold water was initially at 280 Kelvin. So now I've got my equation set up, and it looks kind of like a monster. Um, but all I have to do now is solve for T final. And there's a couple simplifying tricks I can do. I recognize that the heat capacity is the same on either side. Actually, let's make this so that um, we can tell what I'm doing here. Okay, so I'm going to cancel this and I'm going to cancel this because they're the same. And then now what I'm going to do is try to isolate my T finals. Um, and I'm going to do that by um, dividing both sides by 30 grams. So divide this side by 30 grams and divide this side by 30 grams. And that cancels that. And so um, 50, let's do this, 50 divided by 30 equals 1.67 with three, three sig figs. So now that's 1.67. And there's still that negative sign there. Don't forget about that negative sign, OK? So now that's negative 1.67. Remember, I canceled the heat capacities. So all that's left is T final minus 330 Kelvin. And that's a 330 point up there, right? So three sig figs. Um, and now that equals, and okay, so I divided by 30 and I canceled that. So the only thing I have left on this side is T final minus 280, we'll say there should have been a decimal point there for three sig figs as well. Okay. TF minus 280. And so as you can see now, this isn't so bad. So I'm going to distrib distribute this number through. So that's negative 1.67 TF minus, <coughs> and then when I say negative 1.67 times 330 negative, there's a negative sign there, I get 550, okay? Positive. All right? <laughs> and I'm going to drop the units here during my algebra, but I know that the units are going to work out to be Kelvin, okay? And so now that's still T final minus 280. And so now I've got to solve for TF, and I'm going to do that by, let's see here. So I can add the 280 over to this side to cancel that. So plus 280 and plus 280. Okay, so 550 plus 280 equals 830. So now my equation says um, 830 on this side. And then what I'm also going to do two steps at once, I'm going to say plus 1.67 TF and plus 1.67 TF on this side. Sorry, my algebra is getting a little sloppy. Um, so now when I add 1.67 TF to TF, that gets to be 2.67 TF. And then finally, TF is 830 divided by 2.67. And that equals 310. Uh, with three significant figures, we'll say that's 311 Kelvin. And if you think about it, that makes good sense because the 30 grams of water was at 280 and the 50 grams of water was at 330. So that's a, about like halfway between considering that they're not the same mass. Awesome. 
So as you can see, this problem got pretty complicated uh, with the algebra, but we started with this idea of saying negative Q hot equals positive Q cold, okay? So anytime we're gonna do a problem where we have a cold object in contact with a hot object, this is what we wanna remember. Negative Q hot equals positive Q cold, okay? So let's move on, and so, so obviously this is a physical transformation. What happens when we do a chemical transformation, okay? So here is the uh, process known as calorimetry. So that's an experimental method that determines the heat released or absorbed during a chemical reaction, okay? So here is a nice, fancy, high-tech calorimeter. I'm joking when I say that this is fancy and high-tech uh, because it's just like two styrofoam cups, two to make it extra insulating. I'm going to show you what a real uh, calorimeter looks like in a moment, okay? Um, so, but this is more or less what you would do in a Chem 109 lab situation. You'd have a couple styrofoam cups. Um, suppose we've got 25 milliliters of an HCl solution, uh, one molar HCl with a stir bar and a thermometer. And if, if we think about this, if let's say that this is now um, a, uh, so this is going to be, um, closed because we can add mass to it, but it, it should be, uh, oops, excuse me. Let's, let's just call it isolated. We know that we can take the lid off and add mass to it, but when that lid is on, we're going to say that it's isolated. And so if there is, let's think about this for a moment. If there's an exothermic reaction, in an isolated system, it's gonna cause the heat to rise, right? Because if there's this exothermic reaction going on, which by the way, acid plus base is an exothermic reaction. So this wants to release heat, um, but because it's in this isolated container, it can't release heat so what we do in calorimetry then is measure the change in temperature of this reaction. Also, if let's suppose we were doing an endothermic reaction in this calorimeter, we would see the temperature decrease. So that's how we know if something is exothermic or endothermic in a calorimeter, all right? So delta T um, will be uh, positive for an exothermic reaction in a calorimeter, and delta T will be negative for an endothermic reaction in a calorimeter. Um, so not only do we get that out of a calorimeter that we can see that there um, is a temperature increase, and so that's evidenced by they're telling us the initial conditions with no acid was 25 mils of HCl at 18.5 degrees Celsius, and then the final condition was now 25 mils of HCl plus 25 mils of NaOH. And look, the temperature increased. So that tells us that it has to be exothermic. But not only that, but we can calculate the delta H of the reaction as well from this information. Okay, so how do we do that? So let's go for it, okay? So we have got more space drawn out so we can do this reaction. So we recognize that this is gonna be um, HCl plus NaOH. We know the products are salty water, H2O and NaCl. All right, I'm adding, uh, let's see, 25 milliliters of this plus 25 milliliters of this and there's a couple things that I need to know before I can proceed. And it's just like that first problem I did, okay? So I'm gonna assume the density of this whole mixture is one gram per milliliter. You know, maybe if I was told the density, then I could use it. But given that this is aqueous, right, and water is a product, I'm just gonna assume the density is one gram per mil, okay? I can do that because I'm a professor. Um, so we're gonna assume one gram per mil. 
I'm also going to assume the heat capacity of the mixture is 4.184 joule per gram per degree C, which is the specific heat of water. So if I'm assuming the density of the solution is that of water, I also have to assume the heat capacity of this reaction is that of water. And that's a good assumption. Both of these are good assumptions because these solutions are aqueous, okay? So we had to know that before we can even proceed to any kind of calculation, all right? And so what we also need to recognize, well, what equation am I gonna use? Well, I'm gonna use Q equals M times CS times delta T, okay? And now, because I'm doing 25 mils plus 25 mils, and I'm assuming it's one gram per milliliter, this means my reaction mixture is gonna be 50 grams. So 50 grams for this reaction mixture, okay? And so very quickly, I can plug and chug away. I can say for M, um, 50 grams, we're gonna use 50 point, okay? Because I have two sig figs at the 25. So 50 grams, and then CS is 4.184 joule per gram per degree C. And then now what about my change in temperature? Well, my T final, look, look, check it out. T final minus T initial. The final temperature was 25.0. The initial temperature was 18.5. Quick math, that's 6.5 degrees Celsius for my change in temperature, okay? Um, so now when I go and calculate this, okay, so 50 times 4.184 equals, and then times 6.5. Um, so let's see, that comes out to be um, one, two, three. So one point, we use two sig figs. Uh, 1.4 times 10 to the 3 joules, um, which is the same as 1.4 kilojoules. So now that's how much heat was released. But look, it's asking me for the delta H of the reaction. This number is not it. This is the Q. That's the heat released but it's not the enthalpy of reaction, okay? So I need to figure out how many moles reacted. Because remember, these delta H's have to be kilojoules or joules per mole. So here's what I know with my HCl, okay? And I could do the same with NaOH because they're both the same volume and molarity, right? So I know that there was 25 milliliters, okay? And so I'm trying to convert this into moles. So what I need to do is first get that into liters, okay? Because I was told that it's 1.0 molar HCl, and so that means it's in one liter, there's one mole, okay? So when I go through and do all this, 25 divided by 1,000 times one, I get 0 0.025 mole of HCl reacted or of NaOH reacted, because they're in the, the same in this problem. And so now that means my delta H is 14 kilojoules divided by 0 0.25 moles, so let's say divide by 0 0.025, and that gets me 54.4, um, so with two sig figs, that's gonna be 54 kilojoules per mole for the delta H of reaction. So there's a couple things going on in these calorimetry experiments. Just to summarize, for one, we can see if a reaction is exothermic or endothermic based on if there's a temperature rise. Um, if there is a temperature rise in a calorimetry experiment, 
it's exothermic. If there's a temperature decrease in a calorimetry experiment, it's endothermic. Um, we can calculate how much heat evolved in the reaction. So the total amount of heat, so this Q value, that gives me my total heat evolved. And then when I divide my total heat evolved by the number of moles that reacted, that gives me my delta H of reaction, okay? So what does a professional calorimeter look like? Um, so this is uh, a bomb calorimeter. I actually have one of these in my laboratory that senior students get to use. It's pretty cool. Um, and so what you do in these bomb calorimeters, it, it actually is a bomb. It's a stainless steel bomb. And you put your reactants in there and you wire up these ignition wires and you fill this whole thing with tons of oxygen, oxygen gas. So there is a lot of chemical potential in this thing, okay? And note, in bomb calorimetry, you typically study fuel or food. So specifically, bomb calorimeters are designed to do calorimetry on fuel or food. With respect to food, you get what's called the fuel value. So that actually tells you like how much energy you get out of this fuel. With food, you can actually get the caloric value using this bomb calorimeter, okay? So in other words, what you're doing in this experiment, CXHY, so some organic molecule, some hydrocarbon, you add a large excess of oxygen to this bomb calorimeter, so there's no limiting reagent issues in this device. There is a ton of excess oxygen flooded into this thing. And of course, it completely combusts into CO2 and H2O, um, which is the same equation overall that your body goes through to do um, uh, for respiration right? Proteins and sugars plus oxygen to make CO2 and water or for fuel, okay? And so what ends up happening is this whole thing is surrounded by water to keep it safe um, because there's an enormous amount of energy released in these bomb calorimetry experiments. So all of that energy is absorbed by the water. So in this measurement, in this instrument rather, the change in temperature is indicated by the water. So there might only be a couple degrees change in temperature due to the water because water has such an enormous heat capacity. Um, if this water were not there, it, it would blow up. It's a bomb, right? So you have to make this thing useful. You know, it has to be able to be used in a laboratory and not like explode the laboratory. Um, so this is very cool. We do experiments with this in my lab with the, with the seniors, with the physical chemistry students, um, and they dig it. Uh, it's kind of fun. We can put all kinds of junk in the bomb calorimeter and blow it up. Super cool. Um, okay, so that is, um, I'm going to cut it off there for this lecture. And I think, I hope, I think, I'll just have one more video after this. Um, okay, folks, I'll see you later.